Right. I'd like you please to turn with me once again uh, to the book of Judges and the eighth chapter as we continue our study in this, I believe, very practical, uh, very relevant book. And we're going to read from verse four of Judges eight, and we'll read down to verse 21. And so it begins this way. And by the way, for title this morning, we want to just take up a phrase right out of the text. And it's simply this faint yet pursuing, faint yet pursuing. So in verse four, it says, Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint. And I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence to Penwell, and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penwell answered him as the men of Succoth had answered him. And he spake also unto the men of Penwell, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor and their hosts with them, and 15,000 men that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the host. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up and caught a young man of the men of Succoth and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Succoth and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. And he came unto the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto the men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. And he beat down the tower of Penwell and slew the men of that city. Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom you slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if you had saved them alive, I would not slay you. But he said unto Jetha his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon rose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. And again, God will bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Remember, we're looking at Gideon being tested after the initial victory. And we said that he's going to go through four tests. And this is the second test. We, we saw the first one with the men of Ephraim who felt slighted that they had not been called initially to the battle. And he handled that very beautifully. Of course, he, uh, he, a soft answer turns away wrath, and he had done a very nice job in dealing with them and pacifying them and getting his brethren on his side, winning the brethren over. And we said that uh, it's sometimes it's as difficult to win the brethren as it is to defeat the enemy. Uh, it can be a challenge, and he certainly, the Lord, gave him help in that. But now we come to the second test, and again, it's uh, the men of Succoth and Penwell who are uh, showing that their concern is not for the well-being of the people of God in general, but it's for their own safety. 
And so they fail to help when help is needed. And so as we break in in verse 4, it says, Gideon came to Jod and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. So now they've crossed the, the fords of Jordan. They're, they're in the territory of the, the two and a half tribes. And particularly, this incident is taking place in the territory of Gad. Both of these places, Succoth and uh, Penwell, are in the area that had been designated to the tribe of Gad. So again, they're God's people, uh, but they're, they're the borderland ones. They're living on the other side, Jordan. And uh, did not cross over, although they did to help their men, but they, they, they were content to dwell on the other side rather than entering fully into the land that God had promised them. And so it, it, it says in verse 4 that uh, as he passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, they were faint yet pursuing. And so not only does this test come to Gideon after victory, but it comes at a time when he and his men are weary battle weary, faint yet pursuing. And often when we're tested, um, it's difficult enough to face a test when your, you know, kind of faculties are, are good, you're kind of feeling well, you're feeling strong. But when you're feeling weary and tired, Oh, the flesh loves to come in at that point <laughs> and, uh, and, and take advantage of your physical weariness. So this is a this is a very severe test that they're going to go through. Uh, they're, they're faint. Part of the reason they're faint is because they're hungry. They've been fighting uh, battles, uh, which is takes great energy. Uh, they've been pursuing an enemy over a large distance of, of territory, and um, and they've not had food, and so they're they're really hungry. And what they need is some sustenance, some refreshment. Remember when we looked at Jonathan, uh, even just a mouthful of honey uh, restored his energy, so he was able to, uh, to to fight the enemy. And so they're just looking for some some sustenance, uh, some help from their fellow brethren. And so they're faint and yet pursuing. Um, the, the tragedy really about this event, in one sense, it was worse than the first test. The first test was, was difficult enough, uh, but at least the men of Ephraim did help. They did, when they were called to the battle, they came. They felt slighted because they'd not been called earlier, but when they were called, they did come, and they, they, they managed to uh, get involved. But now this second test is Israelites who had no interest in what was going on. They took a, a position of neutrality in the day of battle. Uh, they took a neutral stand. They were totally unsympathetic with those fighting the Lord's battles. They were guilty of indifference. And yet Gideon, despite the lack of encouragement and refreshment, we're going to see he still goes on. And again, it's good to ask ourselves, are we to prepared to go on despite faintness, weariness, and despite encouragement, sometimes we expect encouragement from God's people and there's none. Are we willing to go on pursuing the cause that the Lord has called us to, even when there's little encouragement, little support? That's a real challenge. And we see Gideon does that. Nothing is more trying to the spirit than to be engaged in the Lord's battles and to find no support from those who profess to be his people. The tragedy of apathy and indifference. And again, if I, if I really analyze the biggest issue, uh, why many of us are praying for revival, is that I believe that we're living in days that could be characterized by spiritual apathy and indifference on the part of many of the Lord's people. Just content to live, just content to, you know, enjoy the inheritance that the Lord has given for them, but not really burdened for the work like they ought to be. And so it's a good challenge. Are we prepared to go on? We often sing, though none go with me, yet still I will follow. Remember, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Yeah, are we willing to press on even when there's precious little by way of encouragement? And Gideon certainly does. Uh, so we, we thank the Lord for that example.
So verse 5 says, And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. Now, again, all he's asking for is a few loaves of bread. Now, I want to look at a couple of things here. First of all, I want to think about where this is, the men of Succoth. Interesting that Succoth uh, means booths. Uh, If you know anything about the Feast of Israel, the Feast of Tabernacles is often called Succoth as well, which means booths because it's the day when they make these tents and all the rest of it. And where this name Succoth comes from is back in Genesis. Yes, you guessed it right, the book of beginnings. In Genesis 33, how this place received that name, Genesis 33 and verse 17 We read this, Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of that place is called Succoth. Okay, so that's it's to do with Jacob uh, making booths for his cattle. And that's how it got the name Succoth connected with making booths. So that's that's where it is. It's north of the river Jabok. On the other side, Jordan, and as we've already said, it's in the tribe of Gaz territory. Now, what makes this so so bad in many ways is this, that hospitality is one of the basic laws of the East. And custom demands that the people meet the needs of strangers as well as relatives. And if you, if you remember just going through the Bible, I mean, it's an it's amazing thing, the lengths that people would go to to give hospitality. It's very much a Middle Eastern kind of cultural thing. Uh, it's a big deal to show hospitality, and to not show it is, uh, is brings shame on the family. And so, in a sense, this is serious. that They're just asking for a few loaves, and yet the, the very thing that they, they're famous for in that part of the world, they refuse to do it. Remember, Peter encourages, as we looked at First Peter, the saints who were scattered in suffering. Uh, he stressed the importance of hospitality. Even in their plight, in First Peter 4, 9, he says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. And, oh, how we need to be Uh, committed to the ministry of hospitality. It's a vital ministry, opening the home. And I think it's a vital ministry, not just to people we know, but even strangers. And as you remember, perhaps those of you that heard Ali's testimony, uh, uh, you didn't hear all the details of it, but when uh, they were here in the in, in the U.S. initially, an uncle was supposed to meet them and get them settled, and and he didn't show up. And so they were basically uh, sat on the street, nowhere to go, didn't know what to do, and a Christian family took them in and put them in their home, uh, t- taught his dad to drive, got him a car, helped them get a job, complete strangers. People sat on the street. And uh, I think part of the reason that Ali is where he is today was he couldn't ever get away in his mind from the love given to strangers. And so this is this should should have happened. And we're, we need to be those that use hospitality one to another uh, without grudging. Verse 6 it says, The princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army. So now we get their rationale, their reason for not giving help to their brethren. These indifferent brethren thought in the natural. And in the natural, they're looking at 300 men who were faint, pursuing 15,000 men. Okay. And uh, so in their minds, this is not over yet. Yeah, you may have had some initial success, Gideon, but let's just look at it naturally. 300 weary men tr- chasing 15,000. Uh, Odds are this doesn't look very good. And again, we, we see the 15,000 here in verse 10. Zebra and Zalmona were in Karko and their host with them about 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the East. So again, they're, they're looking at it from a very natural standpoint. It doesn't seem rational that they could win. 
And, you know, one can partly understand if, the, if you're looking at it naturally, you can understand their refusal. You see, if the leaders of Sukkoth and later Penwell give aid to Gideon's army, and if Gideon, for whatsoever reason, should fail to eradicate the Midianite menace, they would invite reprisals on themselves as soon as the Midianites were able to recoup. And unlike the Western tribes, you had the Jordan as a natural border. These are right up to the Midianite territory, you see. So they're first ones that are going to get it. And so as they think through it, they're, they're thinking naturally. They're thinking in the terms of risk limitation. We want to limit risk on our people, and what's the best way to do it? Well, let's stay indifferent in the battle. Let's not choose our sides. It's better to just kind of be on the fence. Let's not do anything. And uh, prudence, really, is what's going on. Uh, so they, 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 it dictated their opposition to Gideon, but really, when it comes down to it, it was a lack of faith. See, it wasn't 300 faint men pursuing 15,000 Midianites. God was with the 300 men. He'd already proved that in the amazing route of the 120,000. And they didn't see that. They didn't see God in the equation. Take God out of the equation. And of course, we, we think like natural men. And there's no faith connected with our thinking, with our rationale. And so they, they're thinking of their own safety. Uh, they're, they're, they're thinking naturally. The, the faith is not in the picture. They just couldn't see that God had granted a massive victory already uh, in destroying the, the 120,000 soldiers with Gideon's tiny army, and they just couldn't see what God had done. And again, it's our failure to recognize what the Lord has done that really produces this lack of faith. If we, if we even think of what God has done in your own life, we ought to have incredible confidence in God. What has he done to you? Where, where were you uh, one time? Where are you today? Uh, again, God has, has done amazing things, great things uh, for us, whereof we're glad, and how he is worthy to be trusted. Uh, not just we've trusted him for, isn't it interesting? I find it incredible that we can trust the Lord Jesus as our savior for our eternal destiny, right? For all eternity, we've trusted him. But can I trust him for today? Can I trust him to meet my needs today? Well, if I can trust him for all eternity, surely I ought to be able to trust him for today. But somehow today's problems seem to be so huge in our minds at times that we, we find it difficult. Oh, Christian, let's trust him more. He's trustworthy. He is faithful. He can't deny himself. This is who he is. This is his character. And yet these people, they're looking at the circumstances. They're looking at the giants. They're looking naturally, and they're failing to think in terms of faith. <clears throat> the amazing thing is these towns would not feel the wrath of Midian upon them, Succoth and Penwell, but they would suffer Gideon's wrath. <laughs> Gideon is going to chastise them tremendously. And so we're going to see that. They're going to fall under his wrath. So they sided with Israel's enemies and were treated as Israel's enemies. And it's tragic in a sense when, <clears throat> when we, we find ourselves under divine chastening, because we've actually aided and abetted the enemy rather than being loyal to the Lord and his cause. And this is what's going on here, basically. Uh, judgment must begin at the house of God. And they are going to, 1 Peter 4, verse 17, uh, Ezekiel 9, 6, remember, before judgment fell on Israel, uh, it started at the, at the sanctuary, begin at my sanctuary, Ezekiel 9, verse 6. That's where it began. And so uh, in a very real sense, uh, we need to be conscious of, of this, that we, we're, we're going to give an account. Uh, and have we been thinking in the natural? Or are we totally engaged 
in the conflict of the ages? Uh, have we been moved out of apathy into action? This is the challenge of our day. Are we doing what we can? Uh, I think of that lady and, and uh, uh, the Lord says concerning her, she did what she could. Will it be said of us in a coming day, he did what he could? <laughs> or what, wouldn't that be a wonderful accolade from the Lord to hear from his lips? You did what you could. But wouldn't it be tra tragic if the Lord's servants working hard, faint yet pursuing, and we were so apathetic, we couldn't bother to lift a finger to help in the cause. And I think we can relate to this. Every assembly seems to have a core of committed saints who are faint yet pursuing. And then there's another group in many assemblies. Now, maybe I'm not speaking of your assembly. If that's the case, praise the Lord. But in many assemblies, there's another group that won all the benefits and all the blessings of fellowship, but they don't want the responsibilities. They're happy to just show up when it's convenient. They're happy to get the blessing and get the encouragement, but don't ask them to roll their sleeves up. Don't ask them to, to really get involved, engaged in the work. No, no, no. They're, they're just kind of uh, happy to coast along. And while, meanwhile, this small group of loyal, faithful servants just keep on keeping on. And uh, they're faint, but yet they're still at it. They're still pursuing. They're not giving up. Notice in verse 7, it says, Gideon said, therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Now, isn't this a wonderful statement from Gideon? Remember how reluctant he was in the beginning? Remember all the encouragements he needed uh, to, to, you know, kind of the signs and the affirmations. And, and yet now this man has absolute faith in the living God. He says, without any doubt, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba, and not, notice who's going to do it, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba, and Zeba, he knows that it's God who's going to win the victory. And when the Lord wins the victory, he said, then you are going to, uh, you're going to be chastised. And so Gideon's faith now has grown. This is why he's in Hebrews 11. Yes, he was reluctant. Yes, it took a lot of encouragement. But once he stepped out, boy, did he believe God. And he, he, we see it here. He's confident in the Lord. Having seen him work marvelously up to now, he's confident the Lord is going to do the work. And yet there'll be consequences for the men of Succoth and Penwell. Divine retribution and chastisement was headed their way after the victory was secured. And again, we, we think sometimes that, um, that, that sometimes we, we, we have this idea that a spirit-filled person is always missed a nice guy. And it's a wrong way of thinking. The Lord Jesus was filled with the spirit when he cleansed the temple. The Lord Jesus was filled with the spirit when he pronounced the woes on the Pharisees in Matthew 23. And the Apostle Paul, when he uh, he said some things that were, were strong things, uh, look, let's look at a couple of them. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, he speaks to them and uh, he says, um, I told you before, this is 2 Corinthians 13, verse 2, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all others that if I come again, I will not spare. In other words, those that have sinned, I'm not going to spare them. When I, when I come again, I am going to deal with them. Uh, we see another example in the third epistle of John, third epistle of John and this is concerning this man, Diotrephes, who had wreaked havoc in the assembly, wanting the very place that belonged to the Lord Jesus alone, the preeminent place. He loved to have the preeminence. And you and I know that that position has already been granted. The preeminent place is given to the Lord Jesus, Colossians 1.18. And so John says, wherefore, verse 10, if I come, 
I will remember his deeds, deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. In other words, he says, I am going to deal with them when I come, with him when I come. I'll remember his deeds. And so, again, we see Gideon also says, when I come back, I'm going to deal with these men who did not come to the aid in the time of battle. Remember, we've already come through Judges chapter 5, verse 23, where the severity of judgment on those that were in a strategic place to help the, the battle of the Lord and did nothing. Uh, back in chapter 5, verse 23, curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord, curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And so here we, we have a repetition in a sense that uh, these two communities, Succoth and Penwell, did not come to the Lord's help in the day of battle. And now they will suffer the consequences. And again, we have to recognize that there is a day coming for all of us when we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we must give an account. So notice, too, that, that their sin, they didn't do anything against Gideon. It was not a sin of commission, but they became guilty on account of what they did not do. It was a sin of omission strategically located to help, having the resources to help, but not doing a thing. And sometimes I think when we think of sin, we tend to think generally of sins of commission. And yet clearly what this is teaching us is that there's another sin equally serious, and that's a sin of omission, a failure to do what the Lord would want us to do in the day of opportunity. And yet the amazing thing is, and what we want to get here, we want to have a positive note here as well. And this is, this is the positive note. Faint people, remember these 300 men, faint yet pursuing, faint people can still do wonders for God. How can that happen? How can faint people do wonders for God? Well, I want you to look at a couple of scriptures. Look at Isaiah, please. Prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 40. And maybe some of you are already going there in your minds. Marvelous, marvelous chapter. And in chapter 40, verse 29, we read these words. Speaking of God, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Isn't that a wonderful encouragement? Don't, don't you take heart from that, that he gives power to, do you feel faint at times? Uh, do you ever feel weary in the work? Do you ever feel uh, exhausted, tired, and think, oh, Lord, I can hardly go on? And yet the Lord says, those that wait upon the Lord, in other words, that, that acknowledge, Lord, I can't do this. <laughs> I am just completely took it out. I can't do this. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Mount up as wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And then New Testament, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 concerning those that are faint. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, here's an interesting thing. It was, he talks about having received this ministry. Now, it's the new covenant ministry, chapter three. It's the ministry of Re Re reconciliation, chapter five. And what he's saying is we can't afford to faint because the message is so critical uh, to the human race, this new covenant message that man can be reconciled to God through the work of the Lord Jesus, we can't afford to slack off. This is the only hope for Western civilization. It's the only hope for mankind. We can't faint. And so he says, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, and again, they've been ben benefited themselves from this ministry of reconciliation. If anybody knew about what it was to be reconciled to God, it was, was Saul of Tarsus, 
the Apostle Paul once persecuting uh, the, the people of God and persecuting the Lord Jesus indirectly because affecting the body, affecting the head in heaven, and yet so far away, and yet he's been brought near, and he says, we have received mercy. And he said, we faint not. We can't afford to faint. Brethren, we can't slack off in our gospel zeal in these last days. Yes, I know there's a lot to discourage. I know that that the work, and especially, you know, some of us have been involved in this for many, many years, and it's easy to get weary in well-doing. Brethren, we can't afford to. The message is too important for us to lie down and give up and quit. We must press on. And so, and dependent on the Lord to give power to the faint. Oh, how we need his help, how we need his strength, how we need him to encourage us. And sometimes when no one else is there to encourage, remember Paul in Corinth, uh, or Paul talks about no one stood with me, but the Lord was with me. Oh, what an encouragement for the Lord to be with us. So just keep those things in mind. Now we move on in our chapter to verse eight. It says, and he went up thence to Penwell and spoke, uh, spake unto them likewise, and the men of Penwell um, answered him as the men of Succoth and answered him. So again, he he leaves Succoth, goes to uh, Penwell. Now, interesting that this place again we have a Jacob connection uh, with this place. Just as Succoth was named because uh, Jacob made booths. Well, if you look back again in Genesis and chapter thirty-two. Uh, this place, Penwell, used to be called Peniel, and there's a reason for that. Genesis 32 and verse 30, we read this, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So it was a place that was named Peniel, now they're calling it Penwell, but it's the same place, geographically the same place. It was the place where Jacob had seen God face to face. Interesting that the men of this place showed a very ugly face <laughs> to Gideon and his 300 faint men when they needed help. Uh, you can just imagine them frowning and saying, nope, you haven't won the battle yet. Uh, we're not going to help you and encourage you. And this place, there's also a tower there. And we uh, learn in verse nine, he says, when he spoke to the men of Penuel saying, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. And so um, what's interesting is years later, yes, Gideon would come back and we'll see that he's going to break down the tower, but a rebellious king called Rehoboam, in 1 Kings 12 and verse 25, one of the first things he's going to do is rebuild the tower at Penwell. <laughs> Again, just uh, maybe it's showing his rebellion uh, that he's going to do this. Um, now, what we notice is that there's a difference in the way Gideon deals with the different groups. And so when he dealt with the men of Ephraim, it was a soft answer turns away wrath. Now he is dealing with the men of Succoth and of Penwell. And how is he dealing with them? Well, completely different response. He says, when I come back, when I've won the victory, I'm going to chasten you. And what that tells us is um, Gideon um, recognized that you deal with different circumstances in different ways. There's not a one uh, strike fits all way to deal with difficulties. And that's why we need the wisdom of the Lord. And I want you to look at First Thessalonians 5, because I think there's, there's clearly here, we need wisdom as we deal with different individuals in assembly life. And some need one thing, and some need another thing. And not everybody, the same formula doesn't work for all. And so notice he says, for instance, we'll just break in verse 12 of 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, We beseech you, brethren, know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. 
and, and to esteem them very highly in love for their works. So they can be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. So some Christians need to be warned of their unruly conduct. They need lovingly to be confronted about their unruly conduct. And so he says, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, uh, the weak-minded. You know, some people, they're just, you know, they're always struggling. They're always full of doubts. They're always, you know, and they just need a lot of encouragement, right? And so he says, comfort. The idea of comfort is with strength. Strengthen the feeble-minded. Some people need a good rebuke. They need they need a warning. Others need to be encouraged. They need somebody coming alongside and strengthening them. Support the weak. Uh, these may be weak morally, or it could be a weaker brother in terms of he has uh, issues, dietary issues, whatever. And and you just support that brother, help him in in his weak condition. And so again, what we're just saying is that we need wisdom, great wisdom from the Lord, because there is no formula. Each person requires a different response, and we need the wisdom of the Lord. Does this guy need a rebuke? Or does he need encouraging? <laughs> uh, does this person need me just to go and put my arm around him and just kind of try and strengthen him? Or does he need me to confront him face to face and say, you are an unruly brother and what you're doing is not right. Okay. And of course, it takes great wisdom, great tact, great uh, help. And Gideon recognizes this and uh, has the wisdom of the Lord. The Lord's helping him as he faced these tests, how to deal with them. And so we notice, so in verse um, 10, it says, Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor and their host with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of all the host of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. Again, that just highlights the incredible resounding victory up to now. You think about that, 135,000 in the army against 300, and so far 120,000 had been dealt with. And of course, most of it was drawing their own sword against one another. And it was a signal victory the Lord had given up to this point. But there's 15,000 left. And so it says, Gideon went up by the way of them that dwell in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbiha and smote the horse for the horse was secure. And so obviously this was a surprise attack that Gideon mounted against them. They felt secure. Uh, they felt they were safely far enough away from Gideon. They felt they were in a place of security. And while they were there feeling secure, Gideon uh, struck them and defeated them with his 300 men. Remember, again, just how the Lord has given help to Gideon. Remember, they're faint and yet pursuing, and yet they're, they've not got any sustenance from their fellow uh, Israelites, and yet they still pursue and they win another significant battle, the Lord working with them. And so it says, when Zeba and Zalmum fled, he pursued after them. And so again, you get Gideon's diligence. He, he's not going to rest until every last one of them he's dealt with. He's not, you know, some of us would think, well, 120,000, yeah, we've done enough. Let's just go home now. Let's celebrate the victory and, you know, let's just kind of go easy. Uh, especially because you're tired and, you know, we've, we've seen this great. No, no, he just keeps on. He keeps on pursuing, even though there's already been a resounding victory. And even after the, the 15,000, he still wants the ringleaders. He wants Zeba and Zalmuna, and he's going to pursue them yet further. And so it says uh, he pursued them. And it says in verse 12, and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmun, and discomfited all the hosts. So Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up. So all in a day's work, uh, in a sense, or you know, even during, you know, just during the night hours. And he said he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth. Now, this is interesting because how many times in Scripture can you think of where there's somebody that is met along the way that has some significant information. 
We think of Joseph when he's out looking for his brethren. He finds a guy in the field and he gives him direction. Uh, we think of David when the Amalekites had raided uh, their camp and taken them. He finds a man along the way, an Egyptian a slave, and he's able to direct them to the camp. And, and again, all we want to just focus on this is the God of providence. So often God has a person in the right place at the right time to significantly forward his work. And what a God he is. How marvelous that he's this God of providence. And so we see this here. It says, they caught a young man of the men of Succoth and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Succoth and the elders thereof, and even three Scots and 17 men. So this, this young man from Succoth, he knows his town well. He knows who the leaders are. And it tells us, actually, it says, when it says he described, I'm told that that phrase he described means in writing. Yet the implication is that he knew it so well, he was able to detail even their addresses and where they were and every detail of them. He, he knew his town well. And so he gives Gideon all the necessary information he needs because Gideon doesn't have a beef against the general population of Succoth and Penwell. His beef is with the leadership. They were the ones who refused help in a time of need, right? So it's not this indiscriminate uh, chastening and slaughter of all of them, but it's those in positions of responsibility that should have known better, that should have been able to see that the Lord was with Gideon and should have come to the aid that was requested. And so verse 15, he came to the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Ah, the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, what that we should give bread unto thy men that were, were, are, are weary. And so he, he does capture them and he brings them back specifically. He's going to kill them, no doubt about it, but he brings them back as proof positive to the men of Succoth and Penwell that he had accomplished his mission. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in his hand. And so it says, he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. In other words, he taught them a lesson that they would long remember. He basically gave them a chastening using briars and thorns. And uh, I can imagine it was a very painful lesson that they were given that day. And uh, again, just uh, things that are there because we live in a cursed world, and he took them and used them as instruments of torture, thorns in the wilderness and briars. Now, we've not given all the details of the discipline other than just that, but anyway, they, what the point is they would never forget that chastening that the Lord gave them. And the Lord is able to chasten. He sometimes uses human instruments. Sometimes he just directly gets involved. But the Lord is well able to chasten his wayward servants. And yet it's a mark of his love, right? We see it again and again in the word of God. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Because he wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to be useful. He wants us to hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so he brings things into our lives in order to correct where correction is needed so that we'll be the kind of servants that can receive that accolade from his lips. Verse 17, it says, he beat down the tower of Penwell and slew the men of that city. So even here, it's more than just a uh, chastening, but he slew the men of that city. So Meryl Unger says this, he was carrying out the divine will against weak, vacillating Israelites who were compromising with the Midianites. The oppression of God's people who illustrate the enslavement that the world and the flesh impose and with which there must be no compromise on the part of a victorious warrior like Gideon. And again, we, we just want to put this in, in proper perspective. There's a danger of minimizing the seriousness of what these men did by siding with the enemy 
they were guilty of nothing less than treason against God and his people. This was a treasonable offense, siding with the enemy against God. So very sobering. Verse 18, it says, Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And so we learned something that we didn't know before. This is a new piece of information. And in a sense, adds to uh, Gideon's pursuit of Zeba and Zalmunna, because it would seem that his brethren had been slain by Zeba and Zalmunna in one of their Midianite annual incursions into the land. They displayed excessive and unnecessary violence by slaying Gideon's brothers. Now, again, we, this is the only place we know this, but we know that it did happen. And so they, as they're asked about who they had slain, they said, well, they're like you are, like the, the children of a king. And so obviously Gideon, who we first meet, you know, cowering down in this wine press, now, because his confidence is in God, has the bearing of, the ch- of a child of the king. And they can see this in him. And they said, they're like you, uh, these men we slew. They have this impression that they're children of the king. I wonder if people have that impression of us, that we're children of the king. Earlier this morning, um, somebody read something to us, and it was about a man who had been saved um, in a rescue mission. He'd been a wealthy man. And uh, alcohol had uh, taken its toll on his life, and he ended up living as a tramp on the streets. And he'd gone to a rescue mission, and in that rescue mission, he'd heard the gospel and got saved. And he was now on a bus, and he was still wearing his garments that reflected his old life, but the bus conductor could see a beaming countenance. And he said to him, you look like you're a millionaire, but you're dressed in poverty. And he said, I am a millionaire. I have spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And, and he had the bearing, even though he looked like a tramp, he had the bearing of a child of a king. And so we might ask the question, what do we look like? Do we, do we look like children of the king? Or do we go about our business and we look glum and miserable and dour And, you know, what do people see when they see us? Do we have that stamp that we're children of a king? And it's an interesting thing, isn't it, that uh, there was a true story of Robert Cleaver Chapman in a railway carriage, and there was a little girl and a mother. The little girl said, just look at that holy man. He never said a word. He just sat in the carriage. But (laughs) this little girl could see there's a holy man. And the early disciples, it's interesting, It said that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they could tell that they had been with Jesus. Can people tell that we've been with Jesus? Do we have that bearing as the child of a king upon us? Now, verse 19, he said to them, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. And as the Lord liveth, if you had saved them alive, I would not slay you. Now, according to Mosaic law, The family was to avenge crimes like this by killing those responsible for the murder. And, of course, it's called an an avenger of blood. There was no police system in the land. And so each family was expected to track down and punish those who had murdered their relatives, provided the culprit was guilty. Of course, you had these cities of refuge. But the cities of refuge was not for murderers. The city of refuge was for manslaughter. In other words, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't deliberate. But a deliberate premeditated murder was different to manslaughter. And so there was no refuge for them. And the family were to pursue them. Just to show you this, uh, we're not going to read the whole passage, but Numbers 35, uh, you have here this idea of pursuing the man, uh, the one who has killed uh, 
a relative. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this is 35, Numbers, verse 9, Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, When you become over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you will appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither which killeth any person that unawares, and they shall be unto you cities of refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until we stand before the congregation in judgment. And so again, this idea of the family pursuing the manslayer. Now, again, if he, if it was inadvertent, different story. But if it was deliberate, then they had every right to pursue them and execute judgment. Excuse me. So verse 20, it says, He said unto Jetha his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was a youth. Now, why is Gideon doing this? Why is he getting his firstborn to do it? Well, in those days, how a soldier died was important to his legacy and his reputation. For instance, we're going to see in chapter 9, Abimelech didn't want to die at the hand of a woman. Uh, King Saul didn't want to fall into the hands of the Philistines. See, there's, a, there's an appropriate way to die in battle, but it's not, it's not uh, certainly to be slain by a youth, a child, would be a, would be a terrible reproach. That's why David's defeat of Goliath is so significant because, uh, you know, am I a dog that you would come against me kind of thing? And, and so there's this kind of a prideful thing about how they would die. And so uh, what Gideon wanted was his son to do this so that he would always carry with him the reputation that he is the man that killed Zeba and Zalmunna. He wanted that honor to be given to his son. He'd be known as the boy who executed Zeba and Zalmunna. But the lad wasn't ready. He wasn't ready for that kind of responsibility. It was too premature and uh, it says, the youth drew, verse 20, drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. But verse 21, it says, then Zebra and Zalmunna said, rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. Gideon arose and slew Zebra and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. And so <clears throat> they, they perhaps in egging Gideon on because there's not so much shame to be slain now by a mighty warrior like Gideon, who now has this reputation, you see. And so they, they want him to, to do the deed. And, of course, Gideon willingly obliges in satisfying the, his role as the avenger of blood. But our time is gone. We don't have time to think about the ornaments, but we'll think about them because they are going to come back in the story. The camel's ornaments are going to play a leading role in Gideon's testing and tragically Gideon failing the final test. But until then, brethren, if you're faint, keep pursuing. Wait on the Lord. He'll renew your strength. Amen.